thanks for joining us another episode in Tea and Trials, FPAN's web series featuring conversations with archaeologists. Today I'm joined with Nigel Rudolph. Would you like to introduce yourself and your mug? Sure. My name is Nigel Rudolph, as you just said. Um, I am the public archaeology coordinator at FPAN's central region in, out of Crystal River, but for the past 12 months, I've been at home in Gainesville. Um, with my fancy gold microphone and my mug ladies and gentlemen is hand thrown by uh, my ceramic mentor his name is matt long he is a uh, faculty at um old miss in mississippi oxford mississippi uh, it is soda fired high temperature um beautiful hand thrown mug made by my ceramic mentor uh, it is very gorgeous, and Thanks. I will say we're going to have to somehow feature some of your pottery on uh, for some social media so people know that you are a phenomenal ceramic artist as well. Uh, that might be a stretch, but I do make pots. That's true. I'm going to actually feature my mug today. So okay. a shout out to Brigitte Stevenson uh, from the Sanford Museum in Sanford, Florida. Uh, she had gifted uh, myself and Bennett Lloyd of the Seminole County Museum both food safe pewter mugs so we could uh, have our uh, matching sets for uh, other beverages. <laughs> uh, but this time it is filled with cold tea. Nice. Uh, not hot because it is pewter. Uh, yeah, so, that's not good. No, not at all. Uh, so we'll get started here. Uh, okay. How did you get into archaeology? Um, via anthropology. Um, my BA, my first BA is in cultural anthropology from University of West Florida in Pensacola. Um, and I got into anthro via sort of my mom and my heritage. I'm a Peruvian American. My mother is from Peru. And I was obsessed with Peruvian art, pre-Incan Incan art and architecture and all that textile work. And so I became like fascinated by the culture, which pushed me into uh, anthropology, archeology, span that that's how I got my foot in the door. And then of course, CRM. Um, uh, my first real job in the field was CRM um, in like 2002. Uh, my secret is I have never done CRM work. <laughs> so I am one of those archeologists you meet. <laughs> um, feel free to hate on me later. <laughs> <Never>. <laughs> so what is your current research? Well, let's see. I mean, obviously, if those viewers are familiar with FPAN, we're all over the place. Um, um, we do all kinds of things. And But my current research for myself, my personal kind of uh, research, as well as the my professional research, is like historic African-American cemeteries. It's totally my jam. Um, I'm obsessed with researching them, with documenting them. Um, I work with professionally, but also, like I said, personally, um, I work with the Alachua County Historical Commission on this project where they're trying to go around as a form of reparations, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Program. They go around and they are documenting all the um, abandoned and neglected African-American cemeteries throughout Alachua County. And there's lots and lots and lots and lots uh and so i've been working with historian karen kirkman who's sort of my cemetery mentor uh, she's amazing she's the president uh of the historic hale homestead um what's up karen and so that's kind of my latest thing um i've been wrapped up in florida archaeology month but we'll spare you that those details <laughs> <for now. laughs> Uh, the program sounds phenomenal, and I really wish that more counties would uh, take a more proactive response to a lot of the African American cemeteries. Um, obviously, with FPAN, we all talk quite a bit, um, so that it's a big issue everywhere, and it tends mm -hmm. to be, um, I don't know, a, a pain to try to deal with uh, different um, governmental entities and the lack of interest in doing the right thing. Uh, yeah, I guess what I find most fulfilling with the 
project is the community though and and working with the community of descendants um even people that aren't descendants but live in the community where the cemetery lies they they have a connection to it they feel a connection to it um and so it's just been really my joy um for the past couple of years of working with uh, these really small scale communities and these real rural cemeteries and, and getting to know the people whose you know loved ones are buried in the cemetery 150 years ago or something like that you know so it's it's really wonderful i get a lot of satisfaction out of that kind of work yeah it is um the connection to the modern descendant communities tends to be a little bit more fulfilling at least in my opinion uh just because you, you get the little i don't know the not necessarily gratitude, but just you can see the appreciation of the people who are yeah. involved in these programs. And it's just kind of amazing. And some of the cemetery folks that I've encountered in Florida are the most passionate and hardcore taphophiles you'll ever meet. And they're willing to bust, I'm gonna censor myself. <laughs> um, they're willing to go hardcore and work every day of the week after their normal nine to five jobs or I'll give up all of their weekends to just try to work in some of these cemeteries and get them to be remotely recognized or cleaned up. So that there's a great group of people out there. Yeah, for real. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so kind of similar, maybe similar. I don't know. Um, what is your favorite field tool and bonus points if you have it? This kind of goes back to the CRM days. Um, my machete. <laughs> I was wondering what you're reaching for. <laughs> this is a on, on uh, Ontario knife machete, a military grade. It's very heavily used. I got this probably in 2005. It's virtually indestructible. Look how thick that is. I was using it yesterday to cut down trees. I mean, this is a badass machete. And if you're in the CRM world, this is far more of a um, heavily used tool than your trowel. Um, I didn't bring in my shovel. My shovel is embarrassed. I'd be embarrassed, frankly, to show off my shovel because it's not in good shape. But this is the greatest machete that has ever been made. I've blown through machetes. I've broken them in half. I've bent them in half. And this is the only one that I can literally um, cut down a tree with. I mean, it's freaking indestructible. Uh, There's my field tool. <laughs> it's such a good one though. I absolutely Thanks. love uh, being able to utilize the machete in the field. Uh, one, because there's just some sort of weird raw power in using one. Hell yeah. Um, but there is a, uh, last time I got to use a machete before lockdown and quarantine, actually working in a cemetery cleanup. And I showed up early to help with like the local community and they're all confused as to why I showed up early. And I was like, no, I wanna be able to spend the next few hours doing all the heavy labor before like these students come in to show them how to clean headstones. And so grab the tools and I didn't necessarily bring tools because it was 6 a.m. and I was not necessarily, <laughs> I'm not a morning person, but there's a machete left. And so I just take that and walk towards the far back and just start going ham cleaning up the tree lines I love and it. Uh, i will never forget he um and he's the mayor of the town and he's just like red what are you doing and it took me <laughs> a second uh redhead red. um and i was like i just i only had a machete he's just like here and like took the machete from me and handed <laughs> the offers and i was like i can do more damage with the machete yeah like, you're gonna hurt yourself and i was like i'm good yeah. but uh we ended up doing quite a bit of cleanup that day, which was really great. I think we ended up taking like eight large city dumpsters of debris away. Um, yeah, it was a massive oh. turnout for the cemetery cleanup. Awesome. Um, so then our next question, kind of rolling into field work, uh, what is the best worst field story? Those stories that you're gonna laugh about now over a few beverages, but in the moment <laughs> they were not so great. So um, I was invited to do this um, storytelling thing here in Gainesville. It's like you, um, it's, it's some kind of popular thing where it's called a conch and you go and you talk, you tell a story and, you know, in front of an audience. And um, this was through the Florida Museum of Natural History. And so the theme of the night was um, 
field work fails. Um, and so I, yeah, it was perfect. And I was like, well, I got loads of those stories. And so I tell, told the story and I'll, I'll make it brief because I had much longer time. Um, but basically, uh, I was working in the Osceola National Forest, which is sort of northeast Florida, um, Lake City area. Um, and it's like a gazillion acres of inhospitable hellhole forest. I hope it always stays a hellhole forest, but it is like a hellhole. Um, and uh, we were working in there and uh, I was flirting with this girl, whatever, yada, yada, yada. We don't need to go into that. But um, we get the truck stuck in the mud. And so that's no big deal. I sort of love getting trucks stuck because I like getting them out of the mud. Um, and so uh, we had one part of the crew, two guys working to get the truck unstuck. And we had holes that had to be, to be dug just in the adjacent area. And so we went out and we were digging, uh, walking down this really rural, like, um, fire road in the middle of nowhere. Um, we saw a cotton mouth. That's cool. Um, walk into this area and it was way into the palmettos, um, which, you know, when they're growing 10 feet in the air, you're like walking on their, their, their trunks to call it the gator backs. And you're like walking across the gator backs. We got to where we needed to dig the hole. I stepped down and I fell to my waist in this hole that was in the ground. I like just sank. The, the girl I was with was just thought it was hilarious. You know, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I could have broken my leg. It's hilarious. And so I climb out um, and I, we were like, well, I can't dig the hole here. So I dug it like, you know, a meter away from that hole. Um, and so we start digging and I look over um, to the hole I had just fallen in and I see this head coming out of the hole um, and it's a cotton mouth, um, probably about four, four foot long cotton mouth, really healthy, you know, like this big around, right? I landed on top of it. And so it crawls out and the girl's like freaking out. And I'm like, well, I was a little uncomfortable, but I, you know, I had my shovel ready. I was like, I'm, I, I don't like killing snakes at all, ever, ever, ever. But I was ready to like, you know, but it went the other way. It didn't want anything to do with it. I'd like stepped on it. Like, all right, no, no worries. I go back to digging. Um, another cotton mouth crawled out of the hole um, right after it. <laughs> and so long story short, three cotton mouths ended up coming out of the hole. It, uh, I was, when I told the story, this guy came up to me afterwards and said, you know what that was, don't you? And I was like, I don't know, a snake hole. And he's like, that was a mating bundle. And I was like, Oh, whatever, man. <laughs> like it was freaking crazy. <laughs> so we, we decided to call that hole and we dug it from the truck. If you know what I mean, wink, 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 CRM, uh, archeologists. Um, and that was it. We got the truck unstuck, stepped on some snakes. That's one of the most, um, there was a come along that broke too. I mean, the whole, whole day was a disaster. Uh, these, so I have a story that I'm going to tell, um, Dude. but the snake holes just seem like the stereotypical Indiana Jones, like trope, like, and it's something that just happens in archeology. span And it's just something that always like puts back my mind about how like, oh, this is just Hollywood archeology. span <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, this isn't real. This didn't just happen. Um, so my first field schools and the field schools that I taught afterwards were in New Mexico. And one of the uh, aspects where we would go out to a um, archeological pit house, but it was kind of reconstructed but it's in the middle of the Carson National Forest. It's not like a tourist attraction. People don't go to it and it just has a piece of plywood over top of it, but the archeologists know about it. So we go out to this pit house and we're talking about pit construction for these um, pre-contact dwellings and um, they pull off the lid and they're like, all right, you can go down into the pit house and you can see the temperature differences. And so this one kid, he's the one who volunteers and the ladder's still there, it's all fine. Uh, it's dark and so he goes down and as he gets like his head probably just dips below like the ground level so he's inside the pit house and all you hear is like this chorus of maracas oh my god filled filled with rattlesnakes <laughs> and he's just on this ladder and you can't he can't see the floor but you can hear this just that stereotypical like rattle noise and he's just like can, can I come out now 
<laughs> and he was just so all macho and ready to go down in. Um, and I will never forget that noise because it echoed in this like chamber. And it's like, yeah, this is exactly like the definition of like an Indiana Jones trope. Like we should have been filming. Yeah, that no that noise is crazy. Those of y'all viewers that have never um, heard a rattlesnake in the wild, it it is so distinct. Like you can't freaking miss it. Like, you know, it's a rattlesnake. I mean, it's crazy sounding. It's so huh. loud. Even if it's just one rattlesnake, it's just so crazy. Yeah, and you can never fully, you can tell where they're coming from, but not fully. You're like, okay, it's yeah. generally <laughs> it's like this somewhere. area over here. <laughs> Um, cause we do the same, we'd run around on, um, basically melted Adobe structures, um, that were just across from our campsite. So we basically camped in this archeological site for the entire, uh, three years at not three years, total three summers in a row. Um, uh, but at the night you can go out to the pit house and you can watch the Milky Way crossover. It's gorgeous, awesome. but you would, the pits of the sunken Adobe create these little caverns where all the snakes would lay in at night. So you jump from one over the other. And the only time you'd ever tell if you had a rattlesnake underneath you is as you're like mid leap, you'd hear that noise and you're like, okay, please let me land. Forget yeah. that, man. Forget yeah. that. <laughs> um, it was wild. And what terrifies me the most now is that rattlesnakes are um, either between selective breeding practices, evolution or whatnot, they're losing their rattle. Yeah. And it's just like, it's nope. true. Nope, that makes them even more terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, so now to completely deviate, get back on track about all the worst field stories that involve horrible snakes. Um, although I still never, I'd rather have a rattlesnake than a cottonmouth. Oh, I, mean, I love them. Yeah. I love cottonmouths. I've got a yeah, nope. cottonmouth tattoo right there. Yeah. No, nope, nope, nope. Uh, they're way too aggressive for me. Beautiful. I like, yeah. I don't like how they chase. Um, <laughs> So our uh, last formal question before we get into our little whimsy is how do you think that archaeology can help save the world? You know, you, uh, you were very nice and you alerted me of the questions ahead of time. And so I had time to think about this and um, uh, it can't. <laughs> it can't. I don't think archaeology can save the world. Um, I, I think that the baggage that is in modern archaeology, um, the problematic history um, with anthropology and archaeology until that's like accepted and recognized and apologized for and consistent appropriate steps are made within the field to right the wrongs. Um, then archaeology isn't doing anything. I don't think it's going to destroy the world besides, you know, being a destructive science. Um, but yeah, and I think there are ways that it can help. Um, it could contribute to the common good, certainly, but the steps have to be made to recognize the errors that were done historically and that are that are continuing to be done within the field and the specific research, um, particularly in regards to pre-colonial Native American research. Um, it's, yeah, it's some, don't study dead people or their stuff, just don't do it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. I think we need to be very, very aggressive about discussing um, archaeology's racist and colonialist history because yeah. it is, and uh, in a lot of ways, still is uh, rooted in its colonialist history, especially because it's exclusionist. Um, archaeology is extremely difficult to get into. Um, it is extremely difficult to maintain a career path, and uh, it's dominated primarily by white people. And so, so really need to be aggressive about pointing that out. I'm going to literally point at me <laughs> um, and just talk about that before really making any strides. Yes, yes. Yeah. And especially just, like you said, don't, you're not gonna learn anything about civilization or like daily lives of people in the past by excavating human remains. No. And if, I'd never understand why people are so and if you could, there's other ways to find out that information. So, you know, like just give up on that one way of doing it. Yeah, respect people. Like for somebody, yeah. for a 
um, profession that is about studying human cultures in the past and has um, a slight respect to it. The way people um, discuss human remains tends to almost remove the humanity from the individuals. Um, so but I, I do see I do see it valuable as a um, studying uh, material culture from the past and as somebody who makes material culture as a ceramic artist, um, I, I understand the importance and the value of material culture within a culture right I, I, I can tell what what these clues, how they can provide information to um, future researchers about a particular time period or a particular group of people on a really nuanced level right mm -hmm. I totally get that. Um, I just, I just want it to our research to, to take a positive step forward in regard to the descendants of the people that we study, um, whether that is, um, honesty about the colonial past, um, honesty about, um, the violence committed by anthropologists, um, in the past to, um, Native American populations or to African Americans, um, or to you know a whole plethora of non-white people um, that have been impacted in uh, negatively impacted sort of in um, in the guise of science, you know. I until that we start working with fixing those issues, then no archaeology can't save the world. <laughs> yeah, and I really think we're at the beginning of that point where we are. Um, I'm using the royal we, but as archaeologists are really beginning to do that self-reflection. Yeah, I think it's like definitely, it's the beginning and I think it's gonna get a lot, lot better and it better get a lot better because that's what needs to happen. Like he's I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I hope um, so. Yeah, completely agree. Um, yeah, and I think uh, just being able to include descendant voices in interpretations is one good way of getting that going because yeah. archeologists have more power than I think they ever realized in the past about perpetrating the stereotypes and racist stereotypes that exist within um, our world today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we'll continue with our <laughs> last uh, little whimsy. Okay. Um, so during these times, uh, quarantine, work from home, uh, what is keeping you sane? Hmm. I thought about that a lot too. Um... I'm a big bike guy. Like I like riding my bikes. Um, and so riding bikes keeps helps to keep me saner. Um, I'm a big reader of Stephen King that helps keep me sane. Um, I watch a lot of horror movies that helps keep me sane. Um, yeah. but all Mm -hmm. you have your horror podcast, right? I do have a horror podcast called little house on the scary. Um, we're available everywhere. Little house on the scary. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I'm not by, I'm not sane by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> it's like all that stuff works for the moment I'm doing it, but this has been an extremely challenging year, um, on every level, not just professionally with F pan, um, not just emotionally, you know, I have a, a what we call a three nager. Those of you who have toddlers, uh, probably are familiar with the term. She's three. Um, she is a force to be reckoned with. I mean, it is just insane. Um, and so that compounded with quarantine compounded with regular day-to-day -day stress compounded with all kinds of things. It's just 2020 was hellacious. My dog is like older than damnation. Um, you know, and she's got all kinds of health issues. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bike riding, Stephen King, scary movies. This Nothing small... to do with archaeology. <laughs> is that most people's response? It's like, oh, archaeology helps keep me sane. No, everyone's okay. <laughs> going to be different. Um, I think a lot of it has like people just getting out within their own community. Some of my favorite was a uh, woman, Sarah Her, started documenting um, street art in her neighborhood. Awesome. Uh, murals yeah. just accidentally started like photographing these amazing, beautiful. Um, works of art in, um, oh my goodness, I forget where they are, but they're in the Southwest. I think they're somewhere in Arizona. That's probably wrong. Um, but that's, she started doing that. Um, another uh, colleague, um, Ed Jolie, 
um, started getting more into like beadwork again and also just being home with family and um, that didn't be kind of the theme that was it wasn't it wasn't career but it's like the self-reflection period that was really helping people keep sane um, mine has been moving three times <laughs> that's really that's how kept, kept you sane shit man. yeah that's like you see saying pardon my become, french uh even better at packing so if you need any packing services <laughs> um, so that's the official end of our interview so i'd like to thank you and uh my pleasure somebody's apparently at my front door because my phone nice. just flew up to inform me of that um so i'd like to say thank you for joining us my pleasure for joining me today and cheers cheers thank you